Thank you so very much, uh, Professor Villankomo. Thank you. Program Director, Professor Puleng Segalo, Chancellor of the University of South Africa, His Excellency, President Abombeki, Principal and Vice Chancellor of UNISA, Professor Puleng Lekambula, and again, Executive Dean of the Tabombeki African School of Public and International Affairs, uh, Professor Sibosiso Bilinkomo, distinguished guests, colleagues, all daughters and sons of Africa watching and listening today, I send you warm greetings. I, I wish to begin uh, on a note of remembrance. Remembering those who left us on Africa Day in years past, and not least during this pandemic year. I especially remember today, Tajuddin Abdul Rahim, a brother, friend, and great Pan-African who left us under such tragic circumstances 12 years ago today, on his way to Kigali to celebrate Africa Day. To echo the text, or at least part of it, of the text of the 1999 Algiers Declaration, I bow to the memory of all the martyrs of Africa whose supreme sacrifice has paved the way for the continent to regain its freedom and dignity. I pay tribute today to the sons and daughters of our continent who laid down their lives for its political and economic emancipation and for the restoration of its dignity, of its identity and civilization under conditions of extreme adversity. As we mark this day, this year's Africa Day, amid a fight against a pandemic and against the backdrop of African unions silencing the gun agenda. The evidence today suggests that the guns are far from being silent. From Mozambique to Tigray and Chad, the guns continue to blaze amid snippets, snippets of lighter developments. The time has come for some honest stock taking. And in doing so, the theme highlighted in the announcement of this lecture, retrospecting to prospect. Quo vadis Africa. Where is Africa headed? That theme is indeed apt. It is this that led me to frame a central question for this lecture. In looking back to look forward and to ask where Africa may be heading, it is important to ask this question. What will sustain Africa's peace? One might ask, does Africa have peace? Therefore, what do I mean by Africa's peace? To be sure, Africa is not without its measure of peace. The vast majority of African citizens are peaceful whilst aspiring to live well, to live long and in dignity. So contrary to what is often claimed, the majority of Africa's young people of an average age of 19 and a half years are peaceful. Only a tiny proportion is involved in violence. And that was re reflected in the report uh, of the progress study on youth peace and security a few years back. We knew that even before then. In the main, the people of our continent are peace loving. But more significantly, I speak of Africa's peace because Africa has a peace agenda, a blueprint for peace, which consists of the things we said we would do to sustain peace nearly a generation ago. Africa has well-developed norms supported by a well-defined peace and security architecture, as well as an, uh, an integration agenda. I still recall how the new Partnership for Africa's Development, NEPAD, 
caught the imagination of many of my colleagues at the United Nations in New York in 2001. And of course, the same thing when the African Union's uh, Constitutive Act broke new ground because of Article 4H, which I'll mention in a short while. It is therefore really sobering for me to convey my key message at the start of this lecture. And it is that Africa's peace agenda is profoundly insecure as a result of deep flaws in its leadership infrastructure. The, the peace agenda is in crisis today. The transition from non-intervention to non-indifference, which was at the height uh, of the AU Constitutive Act, uh, something to behold, which characterized the move from the Organization of African Unity to the African Union. This may be dead. There's a dire shortage of the quality of leadership that would secure and develop Africa. Had we proceeded on the trajectory that was planned, we might have managed to secure African peoples to a great extent and moved significantly in the direction of silencing the guns. Nationally and internationally, the weakness of leadership and the non-rootedness of national leaders uh, and their disconnection from citizens all of this has severely weakened institution at, at, all, at all levels. So with this message in mind, I would like to make five interrelated arguments. All these trends are interconnected and I, I hope you bear with me as I try to tease this out uh, step by step. First, Africa is not short of sound norms. Many of these norms remain relevant for today's conditions. As such, we do not need new norms, but I must say that the existing norms are under attack and they face contestation from a number of sources. Second, many of the situations for which these norms were developed, were developed remain unaddressed. And in some cases, we are seeing a reversal of the very uh, norms, the very ideas that we designed. Uh, and we're seeing this reversal as a result of leadership action or inaction. Third, the institutional architecture that supports Africa's blueprint for peace is not only underpinned by an appropriate leadership uh, software uh, deficit, if you like, and I will describe this later leadership software, please bring, uh, bear that in mind. It is also severely challenged by new threats, which might render the African peace and security architecture unfit for purpose. Overall, this architecture is not only facing a problem of implementation and poor leadership in that respect, it is also not dynamic in response to new, new threats. Fourth, Africa is fast becoming a site in which external vultures of both state and non-state extraction, in which these vultures feast, sometimes cloaked in the image of the Messiah coming to rescue Africa from the scourge uh, of terror. And new and old actors alike add to this complexity. Fifth and last, for Africa's peace to be secure, it must stand on three equal and interconnected pillars in a relationship that places people at the center of the nation and supranation project for the realization of Africa's peace and development. One phrase I will use uh, a number of times throughout this lecture is that of the leadership uh, infrastructure. I've used this several times already, and I think it is important to say what I mean by this. Leadership infrastructure has two components, the hardware and the software. What is the hardware? The hardware is the tangible aspect of that infrastructure, which of course, it's what we all see at the heart of governance and not the software. It includes the buildings, the laws, that confer power to institutions and to the personnel who run those institutions. It symbolizes the existence of those institutions, at least um, 
in the first instance. While these symbols can exercise powerful influence because they project uh, an image of power uh, and possibly sophistication, it is the way that they exercise power confined, uh, conferred uh, on them that determines their continued relevance. And this is the software element of the leadership infrastructure, which is perhaps more important than the hardware. It includes the way that power is organized and exercised, as well as the kind of relationships that it builds with the broader society over time. Outside of the formal realm, that software is also about the shared expectations and interests that form those relationships across society at all levels. Uncovering the nature of the software of the leadership infrastructure requires an understanding of the leadership process. A process-based approach to leadership therefore focuses on how leaders and the communities they serve exchange influence within a given context. And we attempted to do this across the continent a generation ago. That interaction, as one of my students, and I'm grateful to, for, for this co-creation, Lingana Den Mode, my, my PhD student from Mauritius, uh, says it is the lifeblood of leadership. And so we need to sit back and see what uh, our leadership infrastructure has looked like. Over-reliance on the hardware elements of this leadership infrastructure at the expense of the software has rendered governance at national, regional, and global levels unfit for purpose when confronted by challenges uh, such as political uh, insecurity, uh, complete insecurity on, on the military front, or health crises, as we have seen with COVID-19. The crucially important software dimensions of leadership must be refitted to the leadership infrastructure at all levels. And I want to suggest that at some point, uh, almost a generation ago now, that this is what we started doing at the level of the African Union, trying to connect the Union at the continental level with the peoples of Africa in very creative ways, especially when at the national level, all that people relied upon for leadership was the hardware itself. There was hardly any relationship in some context between those managers of the hardware and the rest of the population. So let's look at the evidence. If we did what we said we would do, why are things so wrong uh, today? Let's look at some of the evidence supporting uh, the interrelated arguments. We've talked about Africa's sound normative framework for conflict prevention. We have seen the adoption of important instruments to address the root causes of conflict and to promote conflict prevention. And we have seen the important evidence of what African leaders committed to as part of the transition from the OAU to the African Union. And I only mention some of this in headline form. The condemnation and rejection of unconstitutional change of government. And we have seen what we desired in terms of democratic transitions in the protocol to the African Charter on Human and People's Rights on the establishment of an African Court of Human and People's Rights. The African Charter on Elections and Democracy and, and Good Governance and Governance and the Guidelines for African Union Electoral Observation and Monitoring of Elections and so on. The Solemn Dec Declaration on Gender Equality in Africa and actually also the Protocol uh, to the African Charter on Human Rights on the Rights of Women in particular. I mean, these are markers of progress to be sure. But much of this was embedded in the Constitutive Act of the African Union, which excited all of us at the time as young scholars, as young African scholars in different parts of the world who studied with excitement the new African Union as the work began. And I think it's worth highlighting aspects of the Constitutive Act uh, in headline form as well. The Act is clear in Article 4 about the participation of African peoples in the activities of the Union. In the prohibition of the use of force or threat of force among member states, 
But very interestingly, in 4H, the right of the union to intervene in a member state pursuant to the decision of the assembly in respect of grave circumstances, namely war crimes, genocide, and crimes against humanity. And of course, it embeds within it all of what I said earlier, including the condemnation and rejection of unconstitutional changes of government. It provides for a Pan-African parliament to ensure the full participation of African peoples in the development and economic integration of the continent. In short, a forward-looking constitutive act which placed the people of Africa at the center of it and their protection at all costs, even when leaders of their states make it impossible for them to live in dignity. This excited the whole world. And this is what that excitement in New York in different power centers globally was all about. We then subsequently, almost immediately after the establishment of the union, uh, union uh, the, the work began for the establishment of the Peace and Security Council and of course the African Peace and Security Architecture and the rigorous pursuit of its implementation. Some of us were lucky, some of us were lucky to have been part of that conversation. And therefore, all of what we already know about the Commission, the Panel of the Wise, the Continental Early Warning System, the African Standby Force, and the Special Fund were the heartbeat of this peace architecture. So why are we where we are? Right from the start, we began to see some of the telltale signs. Several strategic plans were developed among them, the Institutional Transformation Program, ITP. Some progress was realized at first, but things began to dip as the term of the first chairperson of the AU Commission, uh, uh, President Alpha uh, Konari, was ending. In an article in International Affairs, which sought, you know, which sought to assess the progress of APSA after its first 10 years, uh, Alex Vines, who had sat in a couple of meetings and also brought some evidence from there, said the initiators of the continental projects, such as the New Partnership for Africa's Development and the African Peer Review Mechanism, among them, Tabombeki of South Africa, Abdullahi Wad of Senegal, and Olusegun Obasanjo of Nigeria, are no longer in office as national presidents. And their successors lack the visionary drive for a Pan-African project. And so while this was acknowledged in several quarters, it might be said that many of us tend to romanticize the idea of the good, good old days of that African Union's founding and what happened at the start, and that we tend not to appreciate the good that is being done in front of us today. It might be said that that's the case. So, so I think it's important to take start, take such observations at face value. But eight years after this assessment in that Journal of International Affairs, let us really take a critical look at the evidence before us and then ask ourselves very frankly whether this normative framework that was set two decades ago that got all of us so excited, that was full of promise, that the, the, that the destiny of Africa was about to change for the better, Let's see whether it remains intact and whether the architecture that was designed to implement it credibly is still fit for purpose. And in examining uh, this, uh, the, the progress made, I want to take a sample of situations. We could take many situations, but in a, in a, in a lecture uh, that is restricted in time, I will focus only on several. And so I would like us to subject them uh, to the test of norm integrity and architectural safety to see what we'll find. So in one of two sets um, of evidences, let's look at elections and unconstitutional change in government. Let's look at AUs, the African Union's recent handling of elections, uh, which are typically in any case seen as the barometer uh, of a country's progress toward democratization. One of the best established norms 
is the rejection of unconstitutional change of government, particularly through military coups. From a time when military coups were the order of the day, we have come to expect that any takeover of government by the force of arms will be met by suspension of that member state and by sanctions. Invariably, the affected member state is supported over time to return to the union. And interestingly thus far, no member state that was suspended by the African Union for reasons of a constitutional change in government has resigned from the union. But the more challenging situation, uh, however, is that of the extension of presidential term limits, either through the front door or through the back door. Those who have chosen to extend their stay in power, unfortunately, are rarely sanctioned. We've seen a few uh, exceptions. But the continent is clearly suffering reversal in several aspects when it comes to this norm of unconstitutional change in government. Where the Africa Court of Human and People's Rights makes a judgment that an attempt at a presidential term limit is illegal or unconstitutional on at least three occasions in the last few years, some states have defied the ruling of the African Court. In Cote d'Ivoire, we saw how the Ouattara regime failed to honor the demands or, or implement the judgment of the African Court. The African court made similar rulings in Guinea uh, and Benin Republic. The, the AU had no say in any of this, in a sense. Cote d'Ivoire, of course, has since sought to withdraw from the mandate of the African court in several ways. And I think uh, many of us are following that, and I would not dwell on that. But the action or inaction of the AU commission has tended to cement a pattern that weakens the integrity of the normative inf instrument and that undermines the legitimacy of our own African court. To be clear, the regional economic communities are not without a role in this as well. ECOWAS, uh, Economic Community of West African States, for example, did not challenge uh, uh, President Alpha Conde uh, in Guinea and President Ouattara in Côte d'Ivoire uh, as such. So this underscores the vital importance of the collaboration between the African Union at the center and uh, the RECs, regional economic communities, uh, on the question of implementation of our norms, uh, at least. And I, I probably should have also said in the first instance that the regional economic communities were from the start seen as part of the building blocks for uh, the success of the African peace and security architecture and the regional mechanisms. But in the case of uh, Côte d'Ivoire, and you know, the, this is an ominous sign of things to come. Uh, the AU Commission proceeded to monitor the elections in Côte d'Ivoire when it could have taken other decisions, including making a statement, for example, that the conditions, uh, the necessary conditions did not exist for elections in a member state, in that member state, and even refusing to deploy election monitors as a result. In the recent case of Chad, following the death of Idris Deby, we are seeing a reversal of even the aspect that the AU has traditionally been better at. So the failure to, by the African Union to sanction or suspend Chad and impose sanctions uh, when, it, when there's a clear takeover by the military, um, you know, which is the bread and butter now of the African Union, the failure to imp imp impose sanctions, if only symbolically, is further confirmation of the reversal uh, of the work of the union. So while the RECs, regional economic communities, are not necessarily faring better themselves, the ECOWAS Commission has a better record of late in terms of resisting these unconstitutional takeovers uh, through the back door, if you like. For example, under, uh, under Beho, uh, the, uh, you saw, saw a refusal to monitor elections in the Gambia with an argument that conditions were not right. And following the most recent coups in Mali, sanctions were imposed, notwithstanding external interest to the contrary. We have not managed to do that in Chad, although the situation in Mali begins to uh, slide to a, a terrible place with the news that we've picked up today uh, as well. In any case, what must we make of such developments? While the AU Commission has many gaps, 
the task of suspending a member state or imposing sanctions uh, is not the responsibility of the commission per se, but that of member states. But the question of the motivation of member states uh, is one that we'll discuss later, that that's coming. However, of the AU Commission, any observer would be justified to draw any of the following conclusions. First, that the AU Commission lacks confidence and is thus self-censoring in relation to the powers accorded to it under the African Union protocols for fear of offending powerful heads of state even when their actions undermine established AU norms. Second, that the AU Commission is lacking in competence, in part. And third, that there is a clear or deliberate anti-norm behavior within the Commission. I myself don't really want to, I don't really think the third is, uh, is the case. But if anyone listened to what uh, I've just said, it is difficult to know which of the above possible conclusions is the real issue. That notwithstanding, 20 years after the establishment of the African Union, almost, one must raise concerns about why an AU Commission is not able to play the critical role expected of it. The expected self-confidence of the Commission seems lacking at the moment, and it's important to get to the bottom of it. In sum, Africa does not lack normative instruments. The challenge is with the effective implementation and the sheer absence of sanctions for non-compliance, which means that all of those norms and our own institutions are undermined systematically. When sanctions are effected, they're done selectively. This inconsistency is a challenge with the work uh, of our organizations. The norms of the continental and sub-regional organizations are valid. It is the abject lack of enforcement mechanisms in addition to leadership gaps that are the problems which are not easily surmountable. Let me now go to the second um, set of evidences that I would like to bring to bear. And it has to do with the Ethiopian Eritrea military offensive against Tigray. The T Tigrayan war is instructive, and this case stands out. It is a situation in which all of the threats to the African Un Union's normative framework come together, completely, uh, or at least almost completing the unraveling of the AU peace architecture. The war which broke out in November 2020 revealed an alliance between the governments of Ethiopia and Eritrea, who has reportedly de de uh, developed, uh, and I don't have these uh, details up to date, as of the time I followed it up to date several months ago, it had more than 12 divisions in Tigray. And it has been much more ramped up since the attack, uh, since the outbreak uh, of the war. Eritrean troops have been accused of many atrocities in effect, if you like, crimes against humanity in Tigray. There is no official count of just how many Tigrayan lives have been lost, but it is estimated that some 5.2 million people need humanitarian assistance in Tigray today. If large-scale relief is not forthcoming, that region of Ethiopia might be plunged into famine in another three months. I think we've picked up those reports in recent times. Ethiopian and Eritrean soldiers are currently blocking aid to the region. Indeed, for much of the nearly six-month war, I mean, now over six-month war, I must say, blockage of humanitarian access and communication blackout has been a, uh, have been a recurring feature. The scale of devastation against civilians in Tigray is of great concern and has raised questions from the international community outside of Africa. We might be watching with our arms folded the largest humanitarian crisis and disaster unfolding on our continent in a, in a while. I know we've had the situation in Mozambique and I'll speak peripherally to that later. It is one thing not to act, 
but it is another to be indifferent when the world tries to help. Thus far, there is no credible or legitimate African institution to deal even informally with the international community on the question of the humanitarian crisis in Tigray. And by the way, we also hear very little about the cost of this war to the entire people, for the entire people of Ethiopia and Eritrea too, that have committed so many of their men and women to this war? How many lives have been lost amongst their soldiers? How many body bags have been taken back to Asmara? And how many have been returned to their families in the rest of Ethiopia? Who is counting the costs? In 2021, when the world, when the rest of the world is aspiring to be even better developed post COVID. Let's not talk about the claims of ethnic profiling and what the UN has been doing when some of uh, its members uh, in peacekeeping missions have been called away, have been withdrawn from those missions. Let's leave that alone. What's more significant is that we are seeing a crisis of norms. It is a setback for the move from non-intervention to non-indifference. The foundations of APSA have been short shrifted. The regional organization that could also respond to this, IGAD, is sidelined, and the principle of subsidiarity seems almost non-existent in this regard. In addition, some of the dynamics of the Tigrayan War confirm new threats to Africa. We're seeing a militarization of the Horn. We're also witnessing a renegotiation of the African state, and I'll come to this shortly. The Tigrayan war broke out on the back of a wounded international system. Actors who do not subscribe to the normative in instruments, the human humanitarian laws, and the conventions, including the AU norms, seem to have gained an upper hand. Non-African powers have done a lot of damage too, with reports that the UAE introduce drones to the conflict with devastating effect. The backing of actors from the Gulf, in short, contributed to the short shift of AU norms. Who is looking at all of this? But so let, let's pull back and look at the African peace and security architecture. How could we have applied it? How could it have responded to Tigray? This is an internationalized conflict and not an internal conflict as has, has been portrayed. Even if an internal conflict, non-interference is not an excuse. Not, non, yeah, it's not an excuse. It is an international conflict. One could ask, therefore, why is Amisom in Somalia? While this is not about proactively deploying a mission, it is clear that African ownership and leadership is glaringly missing on the question of Tigray. What happened to Article 4H? I ask tongue in cheek though. Not even a statement on it or the threat of invoking it is anywhere on the radar. So there was early warning as well, but no indication that there was an official trigger at any point in time. So the fate of APSA may have been sealed by this conflict in Tigray. In one of my research interviews several weeks ago, preceding this lecture, I captured this statement from one of my respondents, which I want to re repeat verbatim to avoid uh, much of it being lost in translation. The African quote, the African continent has betrayed the, Af the people of Africa when one people or political community, referring to the people of Tigray, feel so betrayed by Africa. They may not have expected the, that the AU will support or would oppose, but they were expecting the AU to cooperate for establishment of a humanitarian corridor. What happened to the African Union, to the African media, Africa is silent and indifferent. 
How can a continental organization keep silent in the face of the suffering of the very African people it claims to exist for? The African, the African Union is complicit, unquote. The question must be asked, where is African leadership and ownership, particularly when Africa's representative at the UN uh, you know, imply internationally uh, that Africa would lead? You may have been following some of the conversations in the UN Security Council. There is more to come in Tigray. It seems the war is far from over. If recent reports are correct and the balance is shifting in favor of the Tigray, uh, 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 Tigray People's uh, Liberation Front, the full implications of the horn must be considered before the beyond the humanitarian crisis. There can be no doubt that we're seeing a renegotiation of the African state and the landscape of the Horn of Africa is likely to change profoundly. The nature of the African state is what this conflict is about. Let's not forget. This is fundamentally an unfinished ideological conflict between those who seek a centralized unitary system and those who argue for a multinational ethnic federation, period. Whichever way this war ends, we see a domino effect in the Horn of Africa. The AU, at least the rest of Africa, will be confronted with the question of how to structure the African states. A few decades ago, the leaders of Africa agreed an arrangement to preserve colonially inherited borders. Where are the leaders to lead a new conversation if the current landscape of the Horn faces severe and imminent contestation? Sadly, the militarization of the Horn has already begun. And so this ideological conflict might not be settled without wars of unprecedented proportions, unless African leaders take full cognizance of the evolving situations. As I try to come to a close, the implications of all of this and the role of external actors is something we have to bear in mind. If the silence of African leaders in relation to the humanitarian situation at least in Tigray is this deafening, what hope have we that our leaders will respond in their collective, uh, which is the strength of the African Union to the escalating crisis situations elsewhere, from Mozambique to the Sahel? Perhaps it's already too late. African leaders may have already ceded much of the continent to all forms of external actors uh, with both benign and harmful intentions. The militarization of the Horn of Africa is already in, in process, if not significantly advanced. So avoiding a situation in which Africa becomes the place where vultures feast certainly requires a kind of collective and strategic leadership that is thus far missing. The geopolitical interests in Africa are not likely to subside anytime soon. Look at the strategic location of the Horn. The abundance natural resources on the continent and rurals. The concerns around terrorism and migration by a young continent these are all tied to external military presence in Africa. All powers in the world are using hybrid warfare, including the use of private military companies and so on. So there's enormous international attention to Africa, but it is not only the traditional colonial forces like France that are present in Africa. There are also now third level forces that are building bases in Africa. We can look from Qataris to Emiratis, and so on. Russia is present. Everyone is present. And a number of leaders and governments have already outsourced their own security to external forces. In my own country of origin, Nigeria, uh, our president was compelled by the situation of growing insecurity to ask for the Africa Command, and also France, to help deal with insurgency groups. And this is coming from a country which prided itself as the keeper of peace in the region the only one that could stand up to France two decades ago. So what are we to make of our continental peace agenda? One of the key weaknesses is that the AU has not been able to build the relationship with the Rex. The tension between center and periphery has never been resolved. Question of subsidiarity or subordination. Interestingly, in con contrast, for the first time on peace and security, the AU is now financing most of its political offices across the continent. This is a good trend. The Peace Fund has secured more than half of the 400 million US dollars uh, to start to begin to work. 
but you wonder whether this is a little too late. It's an irony that this progress is being made, is being realized when the political leadership finds it difficult to address difficult crises. So the over, overall, the AU peace architecture is not only facing a problem of implementation and leadership, it is also not dynamic in response to new threats. The AU is neither living up to the expectation in relation to new threats, nor is it able to deal with the impact of a wounded international system, part of which is manifested in the monetized approach, for example, of the Gulf states. These flaws cannot be overcome if there's no rethink of the leadership infrastructure. Looking back, the effectiveness of ECOWAS, African Union, SADC, and so on at the start was related to the level of internal pressure on bad governance led by civil society just a couple of decades ago. But we have seen a gradual cooptation of the people's power. The substance have been, has been hollowed out in many contexts with the leadership of civil society organizations co-opted or decapitated. The relationship between people and continental leaders that we saw in the 2000s have all but disappeared. And this was what our regional organizations and continental organizations connected to at the time. On more than one dozen occasions, you saw how the Afri African Union deployed sanctions. As I conclude, I want to talk about where we have seen a flicker of, co of hope in recent times. It's been from ordinary Africans rising up for the sake of their own fundamental freedoms, for the pursuit of their aspirations to live well and to live long. The mass movements, people's protests in Tunisia, Egypt, Burkina Faso, Senegal, Niger, Zimbabwe, Ethiopia, Nigeria, of recent with the NSAS movement. And of course, Sudan, all of this speak to the commitment and dedication of the people of Africa to take their destinies in, in their own hands. Sudan, therefore, is one that we need to look at very carefully. When sanctions failed, the ICC was contested by African leaders, but African leaders failed to empower their own justice mechanism. So the people of Sudan stood up took to the streets and against all odds, those mass movements were not discounted in the end. It offers a good example, but with a caveat that although former President Bashir was removed, the military structures are still intact. Let's learn from Egypt. There are other experiences to learn from, whereby transitions remain militarized and the civil society valve cannot be shut. Citizens in, so, in such contexts cannot yet sleep with both eyes closed. One eye must be open and watchful. So we seem to have come full circle. We seem to come full circle every generation. Beneficiaries of the mass movements and even liberation movements have sometimes ended up on the other side of the very ideas and people that they supported. And they do not always remember where they have come from. Another generation now is facing their old heroes. So where is Africa going? How can we reverse this trend and rebuild a better regional and continental architecture? Recalling President Abu Mbeki's speech at the United Nations University more than two decades ago, I quote, necessarily the African Renaissance in all its parts can only succeed if it aims if its aims and objectives are defined by the Africans themselves, if its programs are designed by ourselves, and if we take responsibility for the success or failure of our policies, unquote. It is an important first step that Africa's leaders take responsibility collectively. They must, and that they commit to retaking ownership of Africa's security and development agenda. The missing pillar of the leadership infrastructure must be brought back and made stronger than ever. This software, as I said earlier, contains the lifeblood of leadership and it is based on the relationship between leaders and the rest of society. The experience of the last two decades tell us that we cannot just rely on a hollow leadership hardware. If there's commitment to the African peace agenda and to rebuilding a supporting continental peace architecture, 
every effort must be made to build a strong relationship. So I therefore dream of a peace and security council that has non-state individuals that represent the voice of conscience of those member states. I dream of a people's participation in the election of the members of their commission, not least the chairperson of the commission. It shouldn't be the case at any point in time that we do not have a pool of leaders from across our society and government competing to lead the African Union's commission. I really look forward to the competency and commitment of those who will lead the commission and that this will be tested every time. I look forward to seeing the African parliament empowered to engage office holders and people across the continent. Ultimately, the question might even be asked whether a group of states that are committed to the rebuilding of the continental peace agenda might start on a clean slate and set the standards by which others join. In short, a new form of peer review for continental peace. Today's Africa Day is a moment of stock taking, a moment to revisit our common vision and the blueprint for the collective pursuit of prosperity, peace, and the development of African peoples. In doing so, it has been necessary to unearth the painful reality of these times, but it is vitally important to look forward to the possibilities that the future holds if we commit uh, to working together to rebuild, to rebuilding our continent for the common future of Africa's peoples. I thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Olonisakin, for your very thought-provoking and insightful lecture. In particular, thank you for your critique of the African Union and its role in some of the challenges that continue confronting us as a continent, and in particular, some of the countries that you referred to and the challenges that are confronting them as well. And now we're just going to take a moment and show a brief video, and we'll come back and engage further with you, Prof. I am an African. I owe my being to the hills and the valleys, the mountains and the glades, the rivers, the deserts, the trees, the flowers, the seas, and the ever-changing seasons that define the face of our native land. My body has frozen in our frosts and in our latter-day snows. It has thawed in the warmth of our sunshine and melted in the heat of the midday sun. The crack and the rumble of the summer thunders, lashed by startling lightning, have been a cause both of trembling and of hope. The fragrances of nature have been as pleasant to us as the sight of the wild blooms of the citizens of the felt. The dramatic shapes of the dragon's back, the soil-colored waters of the Likwa, Ikreli, Lotugel, and the sands of the Kharahat, have all been panels of the set on the natural stage on which we act out the foolish deeds of the theater of the day. At times, and in fear, I have wondered whether I should concede equal citizenship of our country to the leopard and the lion, the elephant and the springbok, the hyena, the black mamba, and the pestilential mosquito. A human presence among all of these a feature on the face of our native land just defined, I know that none dare challenge me when I say I am an African. I am the grandchild of the warrior men and women that incense the Kukuni land. Patriots at Tetrai and Mpepu took to battle. The soldiers Mushweshwe and Gungunyane taught never to dishonor the cause of freedom. I am the child of Nongaose. I am he who made it possible to trade in the world markets in diamonds, in gold, in the same food for which our stomachs yearn. Being part of all of these people, and in the knowledge that none dares contest that assertion, I shall claim that I am an African.
today it feels good to be an African. And now I shall take this opportunity to pose some questions to you, Prof. These are questions that have been raised by some of our distinguished guests. And the first question is from D. Seizo Manoiki. And Prof, I shall take two questions at a time, just so that I do not overwhelm you and give you the opportunity to respond. The first one is from D. Seizo Manoiki. And the question is, has African Union lost its ability to intervene in states where guns are blazing in the African continent and also in silencing the guns. And the second question is from Protesius Ndawendapo. And the question is, Africa's biggest problem is leadership. How can we ensure that the best people-centered, genuine, incorruptible, and action-centered leaders or action-oriented leaders are identified, groomed, and developed for both public and private sectors. Ms. Prof. Do you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you, Prof. Go ahead. Right. No, no, th thank you so much. Um, excellent questions. Has there you lost its ability to intervene uh, in states where the guns are blazing? Um, I would say yes and no. Uh, I don't want to be typically academic about it, but uh, the, the, the no uh, has to do with the, the template that we have. But we have departed from that template and the leadership question is the reason why we have lost that ability um, to intervene. Uh, that leadership question is front and center of it uh, because unless we have um, leaders whose, uh, if you like, whose agendas are disconnected uh, to the agenda of the African peoples, uh, they ought to be able to stand up to anyone uh, speaking on behalf of African people to intervene uh, without fear, without any kind of fear. We're not seeing that at the moment uh, because we see leaders who sit in the spaces. And I, I know that I'm generalizing so very terribly, uh, but the fact that we have only few exceptions uh, to this rule, uh, sometimes it makes the point. Those leaders who actually only respond to the interests of their own and their networks and their external partners, um, the, who, who connive ultimately uh, with them uh, to, to really destroy uh, the future of Africa. That is the problem that we're dealing with. And of course, you can say that um, on this same question as well, there's complexity to it. And that complexity lies in the others that are present in Africa at any point in time uh, that would normally even challenge the best leaders and the best ideas. And we've never really overcome that as a continent. Um, we have experienced colonization in, you know, by other means, notwithstanding the wealth that we have, because we have not really exploited the space, the, the God-given freedom that we have earned um, over time to respond meaningfully and collectively, collectively uh, to those external threats. So, so uh, I fear that things uh, seem dire at the moment, uh, but it shouldn't be so if we had even a critical mass um, of leaders that can go back to those normative instruments um, and begin to challenge um, the occupiers of this space and deal with spaces where the guns uh, are blaring. Those guns are blaring because of the uh, inadequacy of our response, because we've, we, we closed our eyes and we abdicated our responsibilities. And that's related to the second question, which uh, in a sense, I've answered a little bit. I agree there's a leadership challenge and a leadership gap. Uh, People-centered leaders, I must say as well that uh, if we're not going to keep having uh, cyclical patterns in which we, res we keep returning to this place every generation, um, I suspect we will find in the next few years again, uh, emergent leaders who will occupy the space from all walks of life and speak truth to power. 
but it takes time to spend all this time every generation uh, trying to find such leaders. So I, I think we need two interconnected things all the time. Um, we need to first and foremost apply intellectual leadership. And that, that, that's what the Tabombeki School um, was projecting in one of those videos. Uh, and define for ourselves our own problems. The, the African Renaissance um, question. It's a no-brainer if we are the ones defining the problems for ourselves within the context of Africa. And we're not building Africa as it ought to be. But, you know, we're responding to Africa empirically. That therefore means that we have to challenge and throw out those theories uh, from outside, you know, the handed down ideas that are irrelevant to the context of Africa and begin to build. It requires intellectual power. And that power uh, with the theorizing from an African empirical basis that we must take with us to challenge that space. Part of it, therefore, means that we have to be ready to accept that leaders and leadership are two different concepts. Because to, you know, to lead by yourself is not something that you do. You need the exchange of influence with your very society, those affected by the issues, in order to project this different um, set of ideas that are useful in Africa and might be useful to the world as well, project them in business, in economy, in politics, uh, wherever it is that we are. And so it requires a rethink, honestly, fundamentally, because I think at the moment we're just really singing uh, from uh, hymn books uh, that were handed over to us and not our own hymn books at the, at the moment. That needs to change. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Prof. And the next question that I have for you is from Honzi Matladi. And Honzi, acknowledging the work that the Tabumbeki African School of Public and International Affairs does, she would like to hear from you in what ways, how can the, the, the Tabumbeki African School help package the work that they're doing for high schools to start orientating the next generation of active citizens and leaders who are critical thinkers at an early stage. And the next Thank question you. that we have is from Peto Ratau, who would like to know how best can other African countries receive and reintegrate Ethiopians fleeing into neighboring countries? Thank you. Um, thank you so much. I think I, I love I love that first question. That, that's where we have to return to because by the time we get to UNISA, by the time we are at the TM school, so much has happened in life. We have already uh, bought uh, into all sorts of ideas or even if we haven't uh, already done it, uh, we have clarity of thought about the about our relevance to society, about the kinds of leadership we want to offer. If we're able to uh, intellectually respond to issues around us. Um, it means that we have traveled too far uh, before any kind of meaningful uh, intervention or any kind of um, meaningful work gets done. So going back to basics, by, by returning with the kind of curricula, they, 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 so one of the ideas, and I'm glad that I have a relationship with the TM school. Uh, if I didn't, I would have found a way to have that relationship anyway. One of the ideas that I've been testing out myself is the idea is that we need to return to high school uh, periodically. I've tried to do that, uh, but on a very small scale. Uh, it's a project called, called you know, preparing future leaders. If you start preparing those future leaders in the university, sometimes it's already quite late. Uh, and I think we need to start that from earlier on from school. And the curriculum in schools, um, I, this is a global problem at the moment, but I think especially on the African continent, for a long time, uh, we have been developing curricula, um, also really uh, influenced by the Western uh, ideas, uh, curricula that are not necessarily fit for the very um, environment we're in, because we're not just training, we ought not to be training uh, our, our young ones just to collect a certificate. We have to already be training them to have a vision um, of, of the change they want to make in society and provide them with avenues to test it out, even from a very young age. Uh, it's why certain countries uh, in the world have been more successful than others, because they focus on their societies and the kind of change that they would like to see and they embed that 
in, in, in the process of education. And so I very much like uh, that proposal. And I think the TM school is well placed uh, to begin to think around a package uh, for high school. Not because, uh, and that package for high school is not because now they will, we want to go as universities into the realm of the high school, but it is important to begin to engage different kinds of relationships and short programs uh, that uh, you know, are formed in partnership with uh, whoever the educators are in those contexts. And that become, it should become a matter of you know, fact routinely uh, that we do those things. Uh, I think the potential is there, is all I would say. Um, how best can other African countries, um, in terms of assisting the uh, people of Tigray, it is, it is so complex. Um, it, it is so complex, and that, that's why it's the greatest challenge that we face in terms of um, our ability to respond, uh, to respond. And I chose that deliberately because it's the one that presents us with the greatest headache. Um, there's no way that is opened uh, to, uh, in terms of access to the people of uh, Tigray at this moment. Uh, some have escaped into Sudan, but the idea that um, you, would, you would block uh, Sudan and then block, you know, just block those people in. They're only a population of 10 million. Block them in at all costs in order to finish the work. If, 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 if it was finished in the one month that was planned, then you would say, in any case, any, any death from any war, from any crisis, is always a difficult one. Then you would say, okay, let's open it up and have access. The, the, the formula itself, it's one that uh, is very difficult to, to see. I have no... I think it's fair that the African Union, no less, works with some of those global powers that have been talking about humanitarian corridor. Um, the UN Security Council might revisit it, um, but certainly the US, certainly the European Union, to open a humanitarian corridor is the very least that any society that is at war uh, tries to make happen in order that we do not, I don't think the essence of this uh, ideological war is to really uh, get rid of 10 million people, just like that. Even if we tried, it's not possible. We have seen some very dangerous situations on our continent in the past. So, so, so how best to access them? I would say is that every African that voice should be able to speak to these values. Um, humanitarian as is not something that should be denied any human being for whatever reason that uh, conflict has arisen. Let me leave it at that because I'm not sure that I am competent enough to answer what is a, a brilliant question, really. Thank you, Prof. Thank you. And I have more questions for you. Uh, the next one is from Nomfane Lokota. And the question is, the reversal of the peace and stability situation in Mali is deeply concerning. Why are we here today in Mali with all the work that has been done? So that is the question. And the next question is from Shabira Shabira. And the question is, are we electing relevant African leaders to pursue the Agenda 2063? Thank you. Um, Mali, uh, honestly, I, I will try not to give long answers because it doesn't matter how long my answer is. I may not be able to answer uh, this kind of really deep questions um, convincingly, I mean, uh, appropriately um, in this period of time. Uh, I think the reversal of the peace and stability situation in Mali um, has a historical thing to it. Uh, the kinds of interests that we see in Mali, and you can look at the Sahel um, and see the situation of the Sahel. There are two complete, competing ideologies. Uh, there's an external ideology and an external interest. So, so the, the ideology that you have to, and actually maybe our leaders are bought into it as well. You can say that of Nigeria, of, you know, of all these situations across the Sahel, that when your community, any part of your community feels aggrieved um, and they feel excluded over the longer term, you can visit all of this historically. The idea that we settle it only by force of arms, by you know, military force, uh, if you're talking about the Tuaregs or you're talking about Northern Nigeria and the fact that the Boko Haram situation actually initially was non-violent and it was a response to underlying conditions of exclusion uh, that we then responded to through the use of force. 
uh, that ideological uh, bent. Only military soldiers can be found to what should have been, you know, a societal conversation to achieve peace. It's, a, it's one that plagues us uh, a bit, a lot, actually. The other part of it, though, is the external interest in the Sahel. Um, much of that external interest is to pursue um, external geopolitical interests. And that's what our militaries are being funded for, to keep our citizens at home so that they don't migrate into Europe, uh, and also to try um, and uh, abate, if you like, terrorism, in a sense. How is that possible if you have not dealt with the underlying conditions? Uh, and so I, I fear that Mali is moving in you know, cyclical patterns of zero-sum games uh, to military, to the kinds of responses that are not likely to give long-lasting solutions unless we collectively agree to desist from those ideological responses. If you have leaders who would receive um, external funding all the time, just to prevent you know, their citizens from realizing their, their God-given freedom. Uh, because they face existential threats, citizens in the Sahel, when they define insecurity for themselves, are not defining it in terms of terror um, uh, and migration. Uh, they're defining it differently. But if our leaders are going to be supported by external forces only to repress those citizens without responding to their to the existential threats that they face, then there is no immediate solution unless we change the model. Um, so, so that's why we're here. Uh, thank you for that question. Um, are we electing leaders that are going to, uh, this is about Agenda 2063. The, the, that Agenda 2063, the vision is a great one. It's an excellent one. And those who will challenge it will say, we haven't even dealt with Agenda 2025. But, but, you know, it, it begins from now. It, be, it begins from now for us to be able to elect those sort of leaders. In my talk, uh, I, I spoke maybe near passionately about elections um, because we have seen a lot of reversal. If we're going to be having elections just for the sake of it and anyone can monitor it and just really sign it off. Uh, and I'm sorry to say that, um, you know, my... I, I have colleagues at the African Union, ECOWAS, different um, uh, of our regional institutions that I respect immensely. And I know that for many of them, their hands are tied. But to even monitor an election is already a patronage system. All right? Uh, everyone who wants to monitor and get you know, some money at that time. So when you have leaders who are chosen to monitor those elections, they do not even necessarily have teams of people they can rely on so meaningfully because it's just a, it's a check, checking the box, uh, ticking the box exercise on many occasions. How many elections do we have which have gone really wrong and yet at the end of the day, we sign it off and say on balance, it was free and fair. How can we elect um, leaders meaningfully if we cannot even go through that system, the very barometer to measure our progress, if we can't go, that, uh, go through that meaningfully. It requires integrity, in short. Uh, we, we have to be able to find the reasons why uh, we're together and what we want to pursue together and how we want to pursue it, including the kind of elections and the kind of selection process that uh, we're going to go through in order to have those sort of leaders that will take us, you know, lead us towards uh, the realization of Agenda 2063. That, that would be my, um, my quick answer to that. Great. Thank you very much, Prof. And uh, in the interest of time, unfortunately, we don't have more time for more questions. Um, and I agree with you, these have been very brilliant questions indeed. And thank you very much for responding to them. But I would just like to take a moment to give you this opportunity to give some uh, closing or final remarks that you would like to leave us with. Oh, wow. Um, I didn't see that coming, so I'm going to speak off the cuff um, anyway. I, I think um, there are two points I'd like to make. The privilege of being able to do this on Af Africa Day, um, it's a great privilege for all, for all of us to come together and talk about the situation of Africa. And I, I know that there are many events we organize on May 25th in different ways. Uh, but that uh, President Mbeki has given this kind of platform 
uh, for us to have a frank conversation about the state of the continent uh, is something to behold. And I think it's a real privilege to do that. The second thing I want to say is that, so after Africa Day, um, what next? And this is where I think that, you know, that that's why the, um, that's why Timali existed. That's why T this TM school exists to be able to, and uh, of course, uh, no question, the, the Tabombeki Foundation, to be able to help us take things that emerge from here seamlessly. I mean, today we've done, it's not a laundry list. But in a sense, we're saying the state of the continent is not what it ought to be at, as far as peace and security is concerned. We need an avenue to have these conversations without the fear of contradiction uh, and, and to support our colleagues and comrades that are in different places who might be witch hunted if, this, if they say anything that goes against what the powers of the day uh, think. It's a major issue. And so to have a place, a locus where we can have these kinds of conversations um, with, with utmost freedom, but care as well, uh, so that we can meaningfully take uh, things towards the next step and not come back here next year to say we still have exactly the same problem as we had be, uh, the year before. I think that is something to really reflect on. And I, I'm really grateful that this kind of platform um, exists. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much once again, Prof. And you gave us exactly that, an overview of the state of the continent. And we would like to thank you once again, Prof.